Welcome to the East Asia by Rhodes Murphy chapter summary podcast at the historian's eye. Please subscribe, and if you'd like to be notified when new episodes appear, click the bell icon. Chapter 15, Humiliation and Response in 19th Century China. Section 1, Challenges in 19th Century China. As the population grew, the economy did not grow to meet demand, and agricultural production leveled off. The influx of silver continued. However, increasing opium imports sent much of the silver back out of the country. It was difficult to pay taxes in silver as required by law due to silver's rising value. The Qing government focused on domestic issues as the danger of imperialism grew. Section 2. The Threat of Imperialism The century from 1815 to 1914 was the high period of imperialism. European countries took control of much of Asia. The British Empire grew to include India by 1857 and Burma and Malaya by the 1880s. The French took Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The French took the Philippines from Spain. The Dutch took Indonesia, except for parts of Borneo. The Japanese followed suit, taking Taiwan, asserting their authority in Korea, and dominating Manchuria. Imperialism was fueled by ambition, being generally not worth the expenses it generated. A culture of imperialism evolved. Yellow journalism, a conviction of superiority, and the hopes of converting the backward to Christianity all spurred these efforts. Nationalism was a major factor, driving states to gain colonies to compete with European rivals. Social Darwinism also added to the idea that the strong could and should control the weak. Merchants pushed for expanding empires. Missionaries saw China in particular as a blank slate, since it lacked what Westerners considered a real religion. Missionaries were some of the first Westerners to study Chinese culture. At the same time, they criticized those they encountered as backward. Section 3. Economics and Illusion European industrialization increased the need for raw materials, including sugar, rubber, cotton, tea, and more. Cheap labor in Asia made these resources cheap. Europeans wanted favorable trading conditions and opportunities for investment. Imperialism ignited the Western imagination and responded to popular interest in the exotic. Popular reading was filled with overseas adventure. Rudyard Kipling gave voice to the spirit of the times in The White Man's Burden. Such reading included both a confidence in Western superiority and a fascination with the freedoms of an alien environment. In Asia, Europeans often attained higher positions than they held at home. This coupled with the lure of adventure was an obvious attraction. Asians were not surprisingly offended and remained convinced of their superiority. Westerners fell into four basic groups. First, missionaries were far more numerous. They were often scorned by others, but were most likely to penetrate deep into the countries. Missionaries, along with diplomats, were also likely to learn the local language. The other three were traders and businessmen, diplomats, and military forces. All were alike in wanting their home countries to become more involved and in misunderstanding the situation in China. One major consequence of imperialism was growing Asian nationalism. Section 4. China Besieged Although the Opium War from 1839 to 1842 saw the defeat of Chinese forces, there was no change in Chinese policy. The defeat was considered inconsequential, and the sea barbarians had been driven off. Yet the Treaty of Nanjing was signed in 1842, forcing open Shanghai, Guangzhou, and other provinces to British trade, and Hong Kong was given to Britain in perpetuity. In 1844, the United States concluded the Treaty of Wangxia with China, automatically granting the United States rights granted to any other country. The U.S. also gained extraterritoriality. This was due to concern for Chinese legal practices. The idea of collective responsibility, which had been applied to British and American seamen. Trade. 
the market for Western industrial output was seen as limitless. The treaties that have been negotiated were used to gain favorable conditions for foreigners, such as low tariffs. Though foreign imports never dominated Chinese markets, the terms of the treaties made China a virtual colony. In spite of treaties, the Qing tried to limit Western encroachment, resulting in conflicts. Diplomatic relations were still refused. In one incident, a Chinese ship, the Arrow, had its British flag hauled down, leading to the British siege of Guangzhou in 1854. The Treaty of Tianjin was concluded in 1858, opening ten new ports. The Chinese largely ignored the treaty. A British general, Lord Elgin, burned the Summer Palace in Beijing as a moral lesson. With Hong Kong in British hands in 1841, and ambassadors forced on Beijing, foreign control of China was increasing. Internal Affairs The Qing was more concerned with such things as the Taipei Rebellion, Russian encroachment, and Muslim rebellions. Western incursions were largely limited to coastal areas and of little economic impact. In the treaty ports, Westerners had a bigger impact. A new group of westernized Chinese emerged in the treaty ports. The treaty ports had been chosen to give Westerners as much room to navigate as possible. For instance, the foreign area at Shanghai was surrounded by water, and Hong Kong was of course an island. Later, treaty ports were created further inland. Foreign Bases Shanghai was the first foreign base to become important, and Hong Kong was used as an entrepot. After the Tianjin treaties were concluded, Westerners became more adept in choosing trade centers. The Imperial Maritime Customs During the Taipei Rebellion, British and American consuls collected customs duties, and then extended this, creating the Imperial Maritime Customs. The British, most notably Robert Hart, headed the institution. Unusually, IMC officials were required to learn Chinese and considered by Hart and his successors to be Chinese nationals. Foreign trade never surpassed 1% of world trade or 5% of China's gross domestic product. The greatest impact on China was in new ideas, eventually including Marxism and Leninism. As a large country and great confidence in its own superiority, China was slow to change. Section 5. The Taipei Rebellion Hong Shuquan, 1814-1864, led the revolt. After failing the imperial examination several times, Hong took up a form of Christianity and saw himself as Jesus Christ's brother. He gained a following mostly composed of peasants from South China. The group aimed at expelling the Qing as conquerors. They took Nanjing in 1853. It went on to take 16 of the 18 provinces. Hong belonged to the Hakka, a Chinese ethnic minority, as did many of his followers. He offered a kingdom of peace, which first required adopting a simple or even puritanical lifestyle. Customs such as foot binding, cues for men, use of opium, alcohol and tobacco were forbidden, and Confucianism was rejected. Most Chinese saw the rebels as barbarians, and their form of Christianity repudiated by Western Christians. No support was gained among elites. The rebel government in Nanjing was disorganized and divided by factionalism. The rebellion continued to 1864 with great destruction. Possibly 40 million died in the rebellion. Much of the lower Yangtze Basin was impacted. Self-Strengthening and Restoration Xing Gao Fan, 1811-1872, was the scholar official who managed the defeat of the Taipings. He organized a new army from Hunan, his home province, which then was central to suppression of the Taipings. His protege, Li Hongzhang, 1823-1901, built up another provincial army in Anhu, along the same lines. F.T. Ward put together a volunteer army to defend Shanghai. Ward's successor was Charles Gordon, a British officer. During the Taipei Rebellion from 1858 to 1860, both Tianjin and Beijing were assaulted by foreigners. The result was that the most conservative group at court was defeated. Jing and Li thus had more room for their reforms. Prince Gong 
from 1833 to 1898, took over as regent when his brother, the emperor, died in 1861, leaving his son, Tongji, to rule. Prince Gong and the Empress Dowager Chaisi, 1835 to 1908, competed for power. During the so-called Tongxi Restoration, 1862 to 1875, both supported Li and Qing. The self-strengthening adopted Western military technology. A college for learning foreign languages was established, yet conservatism still ruled, more so since the Manchu hoped to maintain some legitimacy by being ultranational. A recurring problem was the use of gunboat diplomacy, often in support of missionaries or converts. The French went to war with China when one of its missions was attacked in 1870. Other countries took advantage of the weakness of the Qing, including Russia, who pushed into the Mir Valley, having already taken Manchurian territory, including Vladivostok. A Muslim rebellion led the Russians to intervene on behalf of the rebel Muslim leaders. A Qing army under Zhuo Zhantang defeated the rebels and the Russians by 1878. The rebellions continued, however, and the treasury was exhausted. Li Hongzheng and the War with Japan Tongxi died in 1875. He was only 19, and it was said Xi Qi was responsible for his death. In any case, Xi Qi's nephew, aged 3, was made Emperor Guangxu. In 1884, Xi Qi removed Prince Gong from office. Modernization continued. Western-style steamship companies, coal mining, telegraphs, and textile mills were among the innovations. These were not run to be self-sufficient. Railway building was slow and even reversed in one case. Distrust of innovation continued. 120 Chinese students returning from a college in Hanford, Connecticut were treated with suspicion. Officials who pushed for westernization might lose their positions. Zhang Zidong counseled Chinese ways should be used as a base, with Western ways used as tools. Xi Qi diverted money for a new navy to the building of a new summer palace. In 1894, the new Japanese navy attacked and defeat followed. A Japanese contingent sent to protect Korea was also defeated, and the Treaty of Shimonoseki was concluded in 1895. Scramble for Concessions the cry back to the Western Han was a general response to the defeat by Japan, but hardly helpful. Western powers meanwhile sought concessions. The massive indemnity imposed by Japan sent China to borrow from British, French, and Russian banks. In partial repayment, Russia was allowed to run a line across Manchuria to Vladivostok, the Chinese Eastern Railway. Russia and China signed a secret alliance against Japan in 1896. Further, Russia was given a 25-year lease on the Liaodong Peninsula, including Port Arthur. Germans took the harbor at Qingdao, opposite Port Arthur, in 1897. The French took Guangzhou Bay, south of Guangzhou near Vietnam. British took the new territories near Hong Kong and set up a naval base at Weihewei. Rivalry among the foreign powers helped China. A flurry of loans and concessions to build railways followed. The lines were helpful, but gave foreigners more control. Customs revenues collected by the IMC were set aside to repay foreign debt. Later, the Japanese took over the Russian sphere, and Manchuria had a rail network and a mining industry. Though modernization went forward, much of the infrastructure was in foreign hands. Section 7. The Hundred Days of Reform Following the defeat of Japan, a number of solutions were suggested. Some in the government urged the Treaty of Shimonoseki be rejected. Kong Yue led a group of young scholars in favor of radical reform. He was joined by Liang Chichao. Both urged westernization. Kong saw Confucius as a reformer who approved of change. Kong was made tutor of Guangxu in 1897 and presented a list of reforms. The emperor issued edicts, which came to be called the Hundred Days of Reform. The resistance to reform was loud. Xi Qi staged a coup the same year, and Kong and Liang escaped to Japan. Section 8. The Boxer Uprising 
Drought and famine in northeast China led poor in the area to blame Christian missionaries and converts. Cixi fueled their sentiments with their sympathy for anti-national ideas and failed to suppress the groups. The groups took the name the Fist of Righteous Harmony, or Boxers, and began rioting in 1900. Members of the gentry organized the riots because of resentment against missionaries who threatened their roles. The converts were resented because they gained foreign help. The imperial court suppressed the uprisings, declared war against the foreign powers, and fled to Jian. The uprising was put down and peace reached, the Boxer Protocol of 1901. An indemnity was imposed and Xi Chi and her reactionary advisors left in power. No viable alternative to the Qing government could be found. Xi Chi labeled the uprising a rebellion against the wing. Leaders such as Li Hongzhao and Jiang Zidong made it clear to the foreign powers that they opposed the boxers and seemed to guarantee stability for China. The indemnity drained China's resources and made reconstruction difficult. Russia and Germany were removed as creditors in 1917 and 1918. The Open Door Notes the British head of China Maritime Customers, Robert Hart, originated the idea of halting competition for concessions in China. The U.S. Secretary of State, John Hay, put the idea into practice by sending notes to all the foreign powers in China in 1899. The notes suggested the Maritime Customs should collect trade duties acting for China. Though responses were equivocal, Hay declared that all agreed. In 1900, Hay set up a second set of notes, to which all agreed. The policy was not really followed, and Americans gained more trade concessions. The British American Tobacco Company pushed for the importation and cultivation of tobacco. Section 9. Treaty Ports and Mission Schools The treaty ports throve and grew. Westerners dominated these cities. Manufacturing grew in these cities the real beginning of industrialization in China. Clubs and other areas in these cities often excluded Chinese, fostering the growth of nationalism. Converts to Christianity remained small in number. Missionaries thought that schools and other institutions might be successful in gaining Christian converts. Though these schools produced few converts, they were influential in introducing Western ideas. Translation of Western literature increased, read by a new generation of Chinese thinkers. While self-strengthening worked along traditional lines, these new intellectuals were opposed to much of what the Qing stood for. They often lived in treaty ports, protected from persecution.